Okay, for those of you that don't know me, my name is David Cyril. I'm the Director for Research Services for Stony Brook Medicine IT. Um, just so that you understand, uh, I'm not going to talk for the full 45 minutes. Uh, I'll probably talk for about 15 minutes, a higher level overview of research services that we provide for clinical research. Um, we're going to give you a 15 minute demo of REDCap, okay? And please understand, this is just a starter for you guys. Uh, we can always provide you guys with one-on-one um, um, -on -one session or group sessions on REDCap. Um, and that's going to be provided by Tony Jin who is uh, our manager for REDCap. Um, we're going to give you a 15-minute high-level demo of Encore, which is our clinical trial management system. And that's going to be given by Jennifer Burgess. Where is Jennifer? Right here. OK. Uh, so let's start. Um, what's the important, oh, sorry. I cheated a little bit. Uh, this is a question to you guys. What's the role of research at an, at an academic medical center? I like these sessions to be interactive, so I'm actually going to poll you guys for a quick minute. So should I pick on you guys, or is somebody going to try to answer? What's the rule? Uh, to advance the fund of knowledge and also on the side if you can get some grant. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Tim? Okay. Um, Dr. Rosenthal. Um, to, to create, well, uh, it goes back to what he said, the, the new knowledge and service of patient care that forwards the mission of the institution and provides a basis for training. Okay. So. Uh, research is one of the three cornerstones uh, for academic medical center, okay? Um, educational research and clinical care synergistically provide um, services that are not possible within a non-academic medical uh, hospital, okay? For the institution, uh, it improves brand notoriety, okay? Secondary funding source, as Tim mentioned, okay? It also attracts the best and the brightest. For medicine, understanding human phys physiology can lead to uh, enhancements in drug development, uh, discovery dis in discover disease patterns across symptoms, which can lead to classification and diagnosis, across populations, which can lead in innovations in population health. It improves clinical practices through education and care and can develop technologies that assist in diagnosis and treatment. Okay, where does research services sit within the SBMIT organization? Okay, we report directly to the Chief Medical Information Officer, Dr. Gerald Kelly, um, and who reports to Kathy Ross, our CIO, who did the introduction at nine. Okay, so one of the transitions and convergence of how research informatics has been um, changing at Stony Brook Medicine is there's a convergence between, as Kathy mentioned, the research systems groups and the innovation group. Okay, can anybody sort of understand why we've had to do this? Some people have alluded to it. Uh, wearable devices, we're a data consuming economy right now. Okay, and research has to keep tr pace with these innovations. Okay, so whereas, oh, should I take the mic? Yeah. Can anybody not hear me, by the way? Am I not talking? Okay, got yeah. it. I apologize. All right, so one of the things that we've had to do, which was partner with the innovation group. Uh, a lot of traditional clinical research services have been, okay, I need an, uh, a database to track a population of patients, okay? Today it's transcended from apps that log diabetic activity or sensor data, okay? A whole host of, of innovative new tools that can be leveraged for research. And as a way of allowing or best positioning um, our IT to deal with these new enhanced services, okay, we've consolidated these groups into one cohesive team. 
Okay, so there's a lot of interaction between the, the research group and the, in, and the innovation group that develops a lot of the apps and, and new technologies. Stay. Okay, we provide services that help to the entire translational research process. Okay, from anything from uh, when you start from a basic science project, how that translates to um, um, to human studies, so the T1 and T2 projects, also the translation into new knowledge in clinical practice and population health. Our charge is to provide resources and services to support all of Stony Brook Medicine researchers' needs through the continuum of their research. Okay, that, this includes from grant preparation, data collection, study closeout, okay, and long-term data storage. Um, highlighted here is just a, a short list of the platforms that we actually support. I think these are the ones that are more germane to our discussion here today, but let me just go through them. Okay, for data capture, uh, we have REDCAP, which stands for Research Electronic Data Capture. Okay, we also have Encore, which is our clinical trial management system. Okay, for cohort discovery, um, in August of 2011, we partnered with Cerner to implement an I2B2 research data warehouse. Okay. And uh, new to Stony Brook within the last uh, less than three months is actually Trinetics. And I'll tell you why we actually went to Trinetics as opposed to just keep an I2B2. Um, we provide cloud-based storage collaborative tools. Okay, uh, this includes Microsoft OneDrive, but more for research we use Box. Okay, uh, computing platforms, we have expertise in high-performance computing clusters. Okay. We can pretty much spin up any type of resource for you, okay? But we also have been utilizing a lot more cloud computing, okay? This, is in, this in includes, we, are, we currently have on site Microsoft <coughs> Azure, we're working on Google, and we're also working on Amazon. Okay, so let's look at REDCap. Um, REDCap is, um, as many of you, oh, let's take a step back. How many of you have successfully logged into REDCap? How many of you have had problems logging into REDCap and still have issues? Uh, Tony, can you see if you can help them out while I go through this? Okay, so REDCap is a web-based um, tool, form-based data capture tool for managing surveys and building red, um, research databases. Um, we currently have about 750 users, over 170 studies, okay? We implemented REDCap in 2008. It's based off of a consortium agreement through Vanderbilt University. Uh, REDCap has a robust community of, of over 680,000 users, 2,700 consortium sites in over 119 countries. Okay, it's HIPAA compliant. What we, the service that we provide to SBM community is we educational and consulting. Okay, so we can help you draft your project, we can help you um, build your forms and do a whole host of other things as well. REDCap also has an API that allows you to extend the data in REDCap to other systems as well. Okay, so just a point of notation. While REDCap can help you put data into a, a research database, okay, remember the source of truth for any clinical data is the EMR. REDCap cannot take that over, or it, it's a supplementary tool. Okay, Encore is our clinical trials management system. Okay, um, give me one second. Encore's purpose, okay, is to help research coordinators and, administer, uh, and administrators manage the day-to-day -day activities okay, uh, for clinical studies. Uh, this includes uh, budgeting, committee reviews, tracking protocols, enrollment, okay, uh, individualized uh, patient visits, billing for services, as well as reporting to regulatory agencies, okay. We currently have about 150 active users in Encore and over 300 studies. 
Encore is fully HIPAA compliant and, H uh, and 21 CFR Part 11 compliant as well. Um, a couple milestones date to be mindful of. Uh, we adopted Encore in 2015. Uh, we implemented Encore Phase 1 for the Cancer Center in, we started September of 2016. <coughs> We've got two interfaces that go through the EMR right now for Encore. The first interface is a demographic interface, and the second is a labs interface that goes through all the labs that are put in Cerner. If you're utilizing, um, if you have a clinical trial, you can actually pull those labs directly into Encore. In the next month and a half, we will be um, implementing Encore for the remainder of Stony Brook Medicine, which is everything that's not oncology. Okay. I2B2 and Trinetics. So if you're doing any cohort recruitment, uh, cohort recruitment feasibility study, uh, and you want to understand the feasibility if you have your patient populations, um, where can I find patients that help me meet my study's recruitment goals? Uh, how do you utilize data to help drive your hypothesis? You can use I2B2, okay? I2B2 was implemented in August of 2011. Um, over the course of the, of the first three or four years, uh, we got one chief complaint from a lot of our users. It's a great tool. Um, we constantly had to partner um, clinicians or researchers that were trying to use I2B2 with an analytics team member because it wasn't as user friendly. So as a result, um, about two years ago, uh, Mary and Joel, I think you were at a conference, Mary, and you met the Trinetics group. Uh, they came in for a demo, and we loved the tool. It was, it was user-friendly. It packed a lot of functionality. Um, I actually showed it to a couple of research groups, and they loved it. They felt it was user-friendly. It took us about two years to get Trinetics from start of the discussion to actually implement it full in-house. And you'll see a, a full demo of Trinetics uh, today. All right, so um, for Trinetics, it allows you, hold on, Trinetics, we currently have about 771,000 patients, a little bit above that right now. It's provided at no cost, okay? And the way Trinetics makes their their business model is essentially they charge pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies can look across the country to find the best patient populations that c can help them conduct their research studies. Okay? Um, so across institutions, you can also use Trinetics if you have partnerships with other institutions um, to recruit uh, on age, gender, race, diagnosis, procedures, laboratory test results medications, vital signs, blood pressure and pulse, and BMI mass index. Okay, good. Okay, another tool that we utilize uh, internally for collaboration and also data sharing is Box. I mentioned Box before, it was cloud-based data sharing tool. Uh, there are a lot of use cases where we utilize Box. Um, they can be from researchers trying to collaborate on, pro on projects together. Okay, um, sharing large files with other institutions. Okay, in terms of um, research projects and IRB approved research projects, there are about four use cases. Okay, if you're sharing non-PHI for, for a project, um, each researcher that has access to Box, they can share it with their research groups internally, no issues. If you have limited data, okay, um, also limited data for both internal and external use and identify data for a project. Essentially what happens is IT actually governs the access of that project for you. Okay, one of the things that we didn't want to do was give researchers a tool, have them try to orchestrate management of a tool that they had conceptually no idea of how to really govern. Okay, so in order to um, obfuscate the access control of, of data sharing for those tools, 
IT actually absorbs that role. Okay, we ensure to mitigate risk to an institution, you tell us, I'm sharing this data with X institution, okay? These are the people within the institution I need to share that data with. IT will actually go ahead with that process and actually create those shares for you. Okay. Okay, cloud computing. Our approach from cloud computing is that we're cloud agnostic, okay? We currently have a business associate agreement with Microsoft for Azure. Um, we have two additional business associate agreements that we're trying to uh, complete right now. One is with Google, okay, for Google Cloud, and Amazon is forthcoming. Okay, one of the reasons why we took this approach is because a lot of research grants are tied to certain elements of cloud platforms. And we wanted to make sure that we gave our researchers the ability to compete with all sorts of grants. We put them in the best place where we can extend cloud environments for them to do their research. And we also wanted to give them the flexibility and choice, okay, to use the services that they wanted to use. Okay. We work currently with the IRB to implement security and compliance for all research projects at SBMI uh, for Stony Brook Medicine. Okay, so if you have a storage container uh, that you're using for your project, we help set that security. If you're using Box to set controls for access to any of your projects, we set that security. If you're using Encore for clinical trial, we set the security based on what's been approved by your IRB project. Okay. Also, if you're using REDCap for a project as well, we, we, help, we, we help to set the entire thing up. Just a question on the trinetics. Could you just go back to that slide? It was like three, four. Yep. That question there, where can I find patients that will help me by study recruitment goals? Is that something asked by big pharma who sponsors? So when you, when, you, when you set up or when researchers are trying to put in a grant for a, a clinical trial. They're often asked by the sponsors, do you have the patient population? Can you validate that you have the patient population for these types of studies? Trinetics assists with this. With Trinetics, you can actually go through the database and look and find these populations and validate that these populations actually exist. So the institution would be doing that, not the big looking at the, the researcher at the institution will be doing that, yes. And pharma can actually go across trinetic sites, okay, to see where these populations exist. If they they can partner with uh, wherever the populations exist to actually conduct these these clinical trials. Okay. Okay. Uh, research services current initiatives. Um, so we're currently, as Kathy mentioned, we're currently working on uh, a research project governance process. Okay. Um, we're going to complete that in the next uh, three to six months. We're deploying a, a research web portal to publicize uh, the research tools and services and educational op opportunities we provide. Okay? We're going to continue to provide innovative technologies to streamline research, from anything to app development, uh, wearable, uh, and, and sensor research. We're cu currently working on a number of these projects. And our goal is to transform IT by removing of silos and making IT as, as flexible as possible to ensure that we can assist you in the best possible way. Okay. And that's it for me. Uh, Jennifer, you want to start? Sure. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of questions. Excuse me. Uh, just, I just didn't go for this so that we have a record of these questions. I'm going to ask one minute. Use this microphone to ask your question. <laughs> mic you up. Got to mic you up. Go ahead.
not yet. We are. We, we, we've started to um, use the API to actually bring information in from other systems. We're currently working, uh, if you're familiar with, with Fire, we're, we're currently working on a, um, a Fire interface to bring data from uh, Cerner sure. to Red Cap. Uh, I think that should be in the next months. Um, uh, and an encore um, uh, a question on, so you're going to take a populating as a two-way interface between your, you talked about demographics interface and one lab way. values. Yeah. One way. It's one way. Yeah. But how about building compliance? Are you thinking of writing back to your server at some point? Yeah, we're, we're starting to look at that. Um, the, the next couple of interfaces that are slated for onboard is obviously our uh, IRB. We have an API that we're working on to um, seek that information. We're also working with with our uh, building, uh, whether it's research in order to uh, uh, automate the process as well. But we will be able to point out as well. And just one last question. Mm -hmm. oh, can you think of systems that you use currently for IRB or um, transplant? And just want to get an idea too. Okay, so IRB, we transitioned from IRB net to. Here on click. Here on click. Here on click. Okay. Uh, the interface that we're writing would be here on click. I believe it is. Oh. I believe it is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they're slated for the next couple months, right? IRB Net. Dave. Dave. Are you on the online that I can pull up the system? Well, thank you, David. Especially, I want to thank you uh, for the help you've been giving us, me specifically, on image research. I just follow what Mary had asked earlier. Uh, what do you see as the challenges and opportunity that Spongebob can take the lead on in that area? Wow. Um, I think some of our challenges is um, as a financial institution is going through. Um, that's forced us to be more efficient with the resources that we provide to our researchers to consolidate IT where necessary, leverage IT in a better way, and to maximize what we can do for researchers. I think that's been the, the sort of the challenge right now. The other challenge I've seen is um, a lot of researchers have, um, they work in sandbox, they work in silos. Uh, advertising to researchers the services that we can provide to them. Um, exploring better ways for them to do their research that they haven't had you know, the opportunity to explore before. I think it's, it's been finding them and, and exploring those, those uh, conversations has been a little difficult. Uh, we're hoping that with the website um, and a lot of the other services, as well as the boot camp today, that we facilitate a lot more of this conversation. I'll let Dave introduce Jennifer, but I just want to say we're, we're going to be running on a tight schedule here. And uh, so just keep that in mind, because I think everybody's going to want a short break coming up after this. Okay. And I'll put, I'll put that yeah, that one goes back in the middle. That, where's the one for the questions? Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, for our Encore demo, Jennifer Burgess. I said that right? You did. Yes. That was good. Uh, who's the director <laughs> for clinical trials for Stony Brook Cancer Center. Hello. Believe it or not, my married name's a lot easier than my maiden name. So, um, but so I am the administrative director for the Cancer Clinical Trials Office. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Encore. I've been using Encore for about 14 or 15 years now. Um, so I've, I'm very familiar with the system. Um, as Dave mentioned, we've rolled this out with Cancer Center and then we plan on rolling it out to the rest of campus here in the next month or so. So um, Encore has several layers. Uh, you have to build the foundation in order to build the house. So the foundation for everything in Encore is your protocol. So your protocol has to be in here. You add uh, essentially other components within the protocol such as IRB approval, treatment arms, so on and so forth, and we'll go through that in a minute. 
in order to build the essential other pieces, such as the study calendar, adding subjects, tracking subjects, visits, um, Charge Master is in here, uh, and then finally our financials. So I'm going to kind of walk through a little bit of that. Um, Mary, feel free to tell me if I'm going too long because I have a tendency to do that. All right. A little more than this thing, huh? All right. All right. So I just pulled up one of our studies here. Um, so we load all the information. We utilize the system to about 80% of its full functionality. Most institutions use about 45 to 50% of the functionality. Um, so we start, in oncology, we have a protocol review committee uh, that is required. It's a scientific merit committee that has to review protocols before they go to the IRB. We do that meeting within the system. That's the EPRMS here. Um, that's how, in oncology, that's how our studies start, is a submission within to that module where our protocol review committee then meets, and we meet in person, but we go through all the stuff and all of the protocol documents through the system. Uh, we give the approval letter, upload the approval letter, all that stuff is in here. For non-oncology, you would just start at PC console. PC console stands for protocol coordinator console. Here at the bottom, you can see new protocol. That's where you would essentially start if you don't have a committee such as an EPRMS. You essentially load all this information. When you go to update, it will tell you with a, an asterisk what is the required fields, or it's supposed to. Um, but so it, in our newer version, it will have the stars. It tells you what is required fields, what are things that you have to enter, things that you don't. We try to fill it out as complete as possible. The more information you have, the better off you are. Um, the, the system and the questions that are asked vary slightly based on the type of study. So the way that Encore works is they're called libraries. So this is the oncology library. There will be a separate one for cardiology, for public health, so on and so forth. That will alter the question slightly. So for example, in oncology, it's really important for us to know what phase it is because it can go to our data table four for our CCSG grant. Um, so things like that may, may change based on the type of, of uh, library that we're utilizing. So we fill out the basic information. It's very important that we utilize things like the NCTN number, which is the clinicaltrials.gov number. Um, that way, we utilize the system to also update our website so that patients can find our clinical trials that we have open here, as well as click the direct link to clinicaltrials.gov. So it helps with our interfaces with our, our website and, and to our patients as well. Um, so there's a lot of functionality, so I'm going to try to go through it quickly. <laughs> Um, so management, we, uh, within this, while well, it thinks about it, there's a lot of numbers that you can track within here. If your pharmacy has a specific number they track the study with, you can put that in. IRB number, as we work on our interface with the IRB, that'll be nice and, and a crucial component of our integration. Um, for the disease groups in oncology, we focus on different disease groups. That way we know what group is uh, running the trial. So we utilize that system as well. Um, you can track all of your staff. Well. Hold on. There we go. Uh, so all of the staff that are on it, you have to be listed here to be able to have an access, to be, depending on how the access is defined. Um, so we track our PI study coordinators, um, the lead, the data managers, so on and so forth. So anyone that would be on the study. This is essentially like a delegation of authority log, meaning we don't ever delete anybody, but you can edit somebody and give them an end date and a reason for that end date. So that way for investigator initiated studies where you might not have that functionality, you can use Encore for that functionality and documentation. Um, so sponsor is where we would list anybody that we have a sponsor that is a sponsor. So if you have a sponsor like a pharmaceutical company and a CRO, we would list them both uh, because sometimes they have different roles and functionality. Some, for example, the sponsor may provide the IP, but the CRO is providing the funding. So we would differentiate who is responsible for what role. Um, in the system, you'll see that we have the grant number here. This is our research account. So we create a research award for every protocol. This allows us to track what billable items are billed to the grant specifically. Um, and this code can then be used for any time a patient comes in and is having a research test or procedure done. So we have that in here um, so that way it rolls over to the financial console as well as it's available for our study coordinators and nurses who are writing those orders. Um, IND and IDE, these functionalities, these last two tabs just aren't quite what they used to be. So IND and IDE can track whether there is an investigational drug or device, um, but there is no integration necessarily with other components. You, okay. 
<laughs> oh, no pressure. Okay, I'm going to speed it up. Okay, treatment, you can track the treatment arms within here. Um, if you are doing a multi in whoa. If you're doing a multi-institutional study, you can list all the institutions. So what that means is that if, if you're doing it here and then collaborating with another institution and both have the functionality of Encore, they can both use the same instance in Encore and track all of the patient data. We track all of our IRB reviews, documents. I'm going to switch down quickly to the calendar because that's kind of important. We track the study calendar. We match the protocol exactly unless it's a NCTN funded study in which we only track the funding sheet, meaning the things that we're being billed for. Um, so that way our study coordinators can then check in patients so that we can see when patients have had visits occur um, and then track the billing. If I can open it. Um, and then our financials are tied to all of this. So as a study coordinator comes in and checks in a visit, that then pulls over to the financials to say, this visit has been checked in. You've indicated this is a milestone. You are now ready to bill for this visit. And this is the dollar amount that you indicated. So the functionality is multi-leveled. We do insert our charge master from the hospital here that makes our billing a little, lot easier and definitely more in compliance. Um, there's a lot of different roles within it. So some, like our investigators, may have different access than our study coordinators coordinators or, or our financial people, um, but it's kind of nice to have a one-stop shop. I think the biggest benefit is that it's web-based, so you can access this at multiple locations. Uh, you don't have to worry about having to go through a VPN or all these other additional logins to access the system. So I'm, I know I probably didn't demo it anywhere near as good, but that's okay. I have like, what, 30 seconds? <laughs> well, I actually think that Maybe some of you in the room have not heard of this system before, and it's an extraordinary bookkeeping system for yeah. clinical trials. It really is, and, and it's, it's interrelated on so many levels, because you can't do a clinical trial if you can't bill for it appropriately, and it's very complicated because some of the bills the patients would have as standard of care, but what's standard of care, what's not standard of care, all of that stuff is very complicated. And this is, it's really very, very rich uh, yeah. data and very well integrated. And it's the sort of standard, gold standard across the country. So I really think, Jennifer, that you can be around at the break yeah, for absolutely. questions and show people if they need to see more, but. Okay, uh, Tony Jin will do a RedCap demo right now. He's the uh, manager for RedCap. Morning. Um, I have a little bit of a presentation, so before demoing Redcap, I'd like to provide a little bit of an overview. Overview of. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Hi, um, I'm Tony Jin. I work with Dave Sorrell at Research Services. I'm the REDCap administrator. I've um, been using REDCap on and off for about three years, and I'm excited to show you some of its great features. So as we move through the presentation, got to speak up. People got it. Got it. So um, as we move through the presentation, I like for those with uh, no REDCap experience who haven't used REDCap before to think about the question of what REDCap can do for you. And those with REDCap experience, to maybe think more about what more can REDCap do for me? Let's get started. So right off the bat, I'd like you guys to, um, those with laptops and access to the internet, please go to that URL and take my qu quick survey. And uh, this way we'll have some data to look at as well later on in the presentation. So please take a minute to complete the, uh, the uh, survey.
sorry. No, this is a user-facing survey, so there's no need to log in. Oh, oh, it's a survey. Yeah. Look up when you're done. Yeah. Okay, let's get started. So, um, I'd like to just give you guys, um, take a little step back and talk about um, electronic data capture systems. REDCap is, uh, electronic data, is uh, a type of electronic data capture system. So EDCs refer to um, computerized data management software designed to replace paper forms in clinical research. So it allows you to build forms, um, enter data into those forms securely, um, validate the data that you entered, and also export all of the data that you entered for analysis as well as reporting. So the current trend for EDCs is uh, thin client web applications. So what that means is that you can access the software anywhere uh, as long as you have internet access through a web browser without needing to install any local software. And, uh, and also, another current trend is the do-it-yourself type of EDC where you're able to create the forms on your own without any programming or database expertise. So the benefits of the EDC systems as opposed to tra traditional paper-based forms are quite obvious. You have quicker data access, cleaner and more accurate data, greater security, as well as efficiency and cost effectiveness. Just a quick introduction to REDCap. Um, Dave has already mentioned most of the major points. Uh, it stands for Research Electronic Data Capture. It's a web-based application for building and managing electronic case report forms and surveys. In the context of the definition of an EDC, it's an EDC system plus a survey manager plus a lot more tools that can help you more effectively conduct your clinical research. Um, it's closed source for those of you who have more technical backgrounds but it's free to use for nonprofits that join the REDCap consortium. Currently, REDCap has almost 700,000 users uh, located at about 2,700 institutions. 
in, uh, across 19, uh, 119 countries. For more information, go to, you can go to projectredcap.org. At SBU, it's free to use for uh, SBU employees and collaborators. You need a UHMC Enterprise account. So anybody at, at SBM um, should be able to access REDCap using their Windows computer login um, or their uh, Outlook email credentials. It's uh, supported by uh, several groups within SBMIT. It's HIPAA compliant. The data and application are hosted securely on-prem as opposed to remotely. Um, at Stony Brook, we have a self-service governance model for REDCap. What that means is that anybody with an account can log in, create projects, co and collect data, but um, they need to make sure they conduct their work within the boundaries of institutional regulations such as IRB and HIPAA. And also, as Dave mentioned, that they don't replace uh, other tools such as the EMR for um, their data collection if it isn't appropriate. So um, I had a couple of slides to talk about REDCap's value proposition, but um, I'm not sure we're going to have enough time. So I'm going to skip some of that. Um, but suffice to say, it's free, versatile, easy to use, compliant. Um, it has very rapid deployment compared to uh, other EDC apps. And it's self-managed, so the research groups can take care of um, opening a project, uh, creating your forms, and deploying it. Um, so it benefits a lot of the stakeholders involved in clinical research, including project builders, coordinators, uh, lab research leaders, such as PIs, as well as uh, um, CIOs, so on and so forth, and biostatisticians. And these are REDCap's use cases. Uh, REDCap is very versatile. You can use it from anything from a, a simple survey project to a multi-site, multi-arm clinical trial with randomization. Um, and also it has a, a couple of non-traditional use cases. People have used it for, to manage their office workflow, uh, as well as managing uh, volunteers, uh, as well as a data repository for their mobile apps, for their custom-made built mobile apps. This is quickly the REDCap project lifecycle. Um, you start with designing a study, you, you brainstorm the, all the variables you want to collect, obtain IRB approval, create it in REDCap, sign user access, test the project thoroughly, move it to production, and then, um, and then after moving it to production, you would collect your data, monitor it regularly, and validate the data uh, regularly as well to ensure data quality throughout the continuum of your project. And then you would export the data to an, for analysis, uh, um, send it to your statisticians, and also upload it to you know, um, NIH databases where appropriate. And then you would close out and archive the project. So that's, that's really quickly the, the REDCap's project lifecycle. Since we don't have that much time, um, I'm going to go directly to our data to show you the REDCap interface. So I certainly don't want to finish this presentation without um, doing that. So the website is redcap.sonarbrickmedicine.edu. I'm sure you all know that. Um, you would log in with your UHMC credentials, so it's pretty simple. Okay. Yeah, so this is the uh, live demo. So everybody, please log in to RedCap, all of the stuff people. Oh. This is the moment, uh, this is the moment of truth. <laughs> it's okay. For those of you who yeah, don't... If you're not stuck, you can buddy up with somebody if you want to. Yeah, it's... So, in anticipation of people who don't have UHMC accounts, I created a demo credentials, a demo account, and these are the credentials here. Um, so let's have a look at REDCap's interface. Right off the bat when you log in, you see the project setup page. It has inline documentation that provides you with instructions as you uh, learn how to use the system. So 
This is almost like learning by doing. So you would start off with um, adjusting your project settings, creating your forms, um, turning on other customizations, setting up project bookmarks. These are, these are minor um, steps. Um, adding user rights and permissions, and then obviously testing your project thoroughly. As you can see through every one of these steps and every one of these interface elements, you're, the, the programmer or the developer provides a lot of instruction. So it's easier for you to pick this up even if, you know, even without, you know, a priori instruction. So let's have a look at uh, some of these uh, elements. So w if you're a project builder, if you want to build a project, you're going to be spending the majority of your time in the online designer. So in the online designer, this is the interface. Um, you'll see these are the data in REDCap. Forms are called data collection instruments. Um, so in order to create a form, it's pretty simple. Just click Create. Um, you also have the option of importing forms from a shared library, um, as well as uploading a form that somebody else has shared with you uh, in their own that they've created in their own REDCap instance. So the very basics include, I mean, um, to get started, I guess, you would create a form, click into the form, and here are all the fields. Uh, you might have seen some of these in your, uh, while you were completing the survey. And they're, they're very intuitive comparatively, and you're able to add fields, select the different field types. Different field types are there to help assist with data validation. So if you want to restrict your text to just numbers or just dates, you're able to do that pretty conveniently here through the data validation menu. Um, you can select note boxes. You can have calculated fields. You can enter formulas in here. Um, this is helpful for a lot of different reasons, um, a lot of different purposes, calculating BMI, for example, or um, if you have like a social science or a psychiatric rating scale and you have scores and subscores, you're able to use this calculated field to provide those values or to compute those values. Um, there's drop down lists, radio buttons, check boxes, yes, no answers, yes, no items, true, false items. These are just, these are just different types of multiple choice uh, items. There's signatures, so you can actually um, you can actually provide a signature field where somebody could actually track their signature um, and, and sign their name digitally. Um, there's file upload fields in order, just in case there's a sort of other file attachments that you want to uh, include in your project. There's a visual analog scale, um, a slider where you can indicate sort of, a, it's more like a continuous measurement. Uh, descriptive text fields for instructions, um, as well as an SQL field, which is a, l a little bit more advanced. Uh, this is only for administrators, so I probably shouldn't go over it uh, for this section. So you're going to, so most people are going to be spending the majority of their time on, on the online designer. Um, but there's different ways. There's also other ways of. There's another way of creating uh, surveys, which is or structuring your data collection instruments, which is through a data dictionary. So this way, all your data dictionaries are collected in one Excel spreadsheet, and you can just upload that Excel spreadsheet, uh, given that it's formatted correctly, directly into REDCap, and REDCap will, uh, will import and interpret those forms. So we're run running low on time, so. We are running low on time, and I, I think everybody deserves a break, but yep. I, I have a question. Absolutely. If people need help. Yes. Uh, that, I think, is the is the key thing to take away from this because in a five minute demonstration you can see that this is a very powerful tool. It can be used in very flexible ways. Anything that's flexible is always a little bit difficult. And so I think that it's the, if it's the first time you're using REDCap, we want to encourage you to understand that it's there and what you might want to use it for. But this is key. Right. Yeah, so I wanted to, I definitely wanted to make you guys aware of all the different resources that are available to you for, uh, to help you better, to better take advantage of REDCap. Um, there's in-app resources, as I mentioned, a lot of inline documentation as well as an FAQ and training videos all included in the app. Um, I think also we do interface. have some people here that if you get through all of that and you still have questions, I, I think yeah. uh, 
Yeah, definitely feel. Yeah, definitely feel free to reach out to us as well at um, RedCat Administrators at sbumed.org. Um, there are a couple of us, mostly, mostly me. <laughs> We'll answer your questions, and uh, we, all, we also offer consultations in your specific use case, as well as technical Q&A to help you maximize RedCap's capabilities. There's also a, a Coursera course that's run by the creator of RedCap, and a new session starts in about two weeks. So if you're interested, it's, uh, it's, it, it uses RedCap to help you teach best practices for data management and clinical research. So if you're interested, feel free to sign up. It's free for non-certificate users, like most Coursera courses are. And um, resources to come. Long story short, this is a web portal that helps us sort of, um, um, I guess, market and, and publicize REDCap. Uh, there's going to be weekly tips, in-depth training videos, office hours, training sessions for beginner and advanced users, as well as boilerplate language, as well as um, letters of support um, for uh, your grants and papers. This is really exciting. Thank you so much. And I hope everybody has all of these resources. And the Coursera course should be very, very useful as well. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So a lot of